All right, shun, T-I-O-N. The word means the action of or the result of. And so today I want us to look at salvation. <laughs> what an amazing word. And we're going to have probably two different reactions today. For some of you, it is going to be a word of just revival and encouragement to know that you are saved. That you're a child of God. And that God did something for you that is this remarkable. Uh, even though we didn't deserve it. And so for you today as we go down this simple road. And if you don't catch this. We're simply going down the road to Romans. The road to salvation through the book of Romans. It's sort of a teaser for our life group study. And so I've changed some of the words and the notes and stuff. But it's the simple something I learned when I was a little kid coming to church. About the Romans road to salvation. And so for those of you that are saved. Man this sort of brighten your day and encourage you and refresh again. What, what God has done in your life. For someone else I know today. Today is going to be a brand new day for you. Today old things are going to pass away. And all things are going to become new. And you're going to receive God's salvation. So I just give God praise for that before we even see it. Because I know God is going to do it. The Greek word in the New Testament. The New Testament wasn't written in English. But we go back and look at the Greek word. And the Greek word for salvation is soteria. Soteria. And this is what it means. It means deliverance, preservation, safety, salvation, of course. If we go down to that B in your notes, the little B, it says, that which concludes to the soul's safety. I like that. It is safety of the soul. If you move on down to that number two, it says salvation as the present possession of all true Christians. So... It has given us safety for our soul. It has given us that. And it is a present possession that we have. And then if you move on down to number three where it talks about the future, it says it's the sum of all benefits and blessings which the Christians, redeemed from all earthly ills, will enjoy after the visible return of Christ from heaven in the consummated and eternal kingdom of God. And so salvation is something we look back at and marvel that God did that for us. And salvation is something we presently possess and can't understand it, but it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. And salvation is something we look at tomorrow in our future and we think of the great things that God has in store for His people that are saved because of His grace. And so, what a wonderful thing. So let's go here. Romans 3 and 23. Everyone has sinned. Did that surprise anybody? We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Now, I like to pick the Word of God apart. And I want you to look at what the Word of God has done for us here. It's given us a, a two different tenses. It says, everyone has sinned. Everyone has sinned. Nobody has a problem with that, right? That you have, you look back, and you have sinned. But Paul doesn't leave us hanging there. Paul says we all fall short of God's glorious standard. And so that deals with our present. In other words, Jonathan has sinned. There's no doubt about it. But I've made my mistakes. My fair share of them. And I could call some of them accidents, and I'd have to call some of them premeditated. Has anybody ever premeditated and sinned? Absolutely. We're in church. Not many people raise their hand. we got a recovery guy raising his hand. That's about it. A few back here. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. In other words, the best I can do still is short of God's glorious standard. So hang, hang there with me just for a minute. And let's go to our point. Everyone needs salvation, but everyone doesn't know it. Salvation isn't just for the religious or for those who think they need it. Salvation is for everyone because everyone needs it. You and I were born in a world that is cursed, it is wicked, it is evil, it is exceedingly sinful. And we have something to do with that because we're a part of it. And the Bible says that we've all sinned and that we all miss the mark and that we all fall short and still do. And the Bible teaches us that sin comes with a price. 
I mean, I hate sin. Do y'all hate sin? Man, look at, look at what sin has brought to this earth. Sickness, addiction, death, man. Wars, fighting. It's sin. It's the result of sin. It's the world we live in. So the Bible teaches us that everyone needs God's salvation. But you know, there, there are still people that don't know that, don't realize their need. God has placed some people around you that He's wanting you to show them their need for salvation. Not their need to live like you or not their need to be a good person like you are, but their need for salvation, just like you had that need for salvation. Now let's just get away from international missions for a minute. We'll talk more about that at the end of service. But there are still people here in the Bible Belt that don't know they need salvation. And God's put them in your life. And so as we go through these simple verses today, you may want to say, but I'm saved. I, well, these are simple verses. I don't need these verses. These are verses of life. And those key people that God has placed in your life, God wants you to share these verses with them. He wants you to live these verses in front of them. He wants you, everybody in this place needs to know how to tell somebody how to receive this salvation. Because the Bible tells us that everyone that has not received the salvation does not go to heaven. Does not go to heaven. But goes to hell. So can't you see how it's important for us, even if we know it, to know it some more? Even if we've memorized them, to, to go back and hear them again? Not only to lift up our spirits and re-energize the work that God has done in us, but to, to give us a more boldness and, and, and diligence and courageous spirit and heart to tell each other and other people about their need for God's salvation. Romans 6 and 23 says the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words it says wages is something that we that's what you work for. Your wages is you work all week you hope to get paid right? That's your wages. And, and the Bible tells us that we work you know we, we work and work and work in sin and the wages of that is death and we look all around us and we see that it is true it is true but God came and said here instead of wages for salvation I will make salvation a free gift for you and I want to say something to you today I don't care what preacher says it or who you hear on the TV that says it, or the radio, or what book you've got, or your favorite Bible commenta commentator. Listen to me. The Word of God says salvation is a free gift. You can't pay for it. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. It is God's masterpiece, and it's finished, and He says here, it's free. Well, I don't seem fair. That's what the people told Jesus. Remember when, when Jesus talked about the story where the guy paid the people for working and some of them started real early and some of them started real late and he paid them all the same thing. And the people that started early, they were fine with what they were going to get paid with until they found out that the people that came late to the party got the same thing from God. We can't have that same kind of spirit. Just because you've trusted God and served God and sacrificed for God and you've done all the... You can you you got to know that salvation is a free gift. A free gift. And He's given it for us to receive. Romans 6 and 3 tells us this. One sin... Say one. One sin disqualifies you from heaven. One. Just one. One. I put a little quiz right here on your notes. How many in school did you love it? You had a test, right? And you sat down and found that it was multiple choice. <laughs> Isn't that great? Right? Didn't you hate it when you sat down and it was filling the blanks? And you're like, at least with multiple choice, you got a chance. You got 25% chance. And we was always taught growing up that C, if you didn't know, just pick C. Because there's chance, greater chance. I don't know why. 
You know, you know, teachers heard that, so they probably never made C the right answer. And we was all too stupid enough. We was always picking C, and they knew it. But multiple choice was, it was, so I wanted to help you out today. So I gave you multiple choice, and let's see how we do on it. The question, how good do you have to be to go to heaven? Multiple choice. A, pretty good. B, really good. C, better than Uncle Joe. <laughs> I don't know who Uncle Joe is. Obviously, he's a pretty good guy. We're just assuming that Uncle Joe is a good old boy. Or D, <laughs> perfect. So what's the answer? Now, don't say anything out loud unless you really know. We wouldn't want you to be embarrassed today. Here's the deal with this. If we had Jeff walk behind me with a camera down the streets of Aniston and we just ask people this question, how good do you have to be to go to heaven, sir? Pretty good, really good, better than Uncle Joe or perfect? Most of the people that you ask this question are going to say, hey, pretty good. I live a pretty good life. As long as I'm pretty good, I believe I go to God's heaven. And some people say really good. These are most, most time your church people. Right? These are the people that, they, they don't know why their family won't get saved, but every time they see them, they don't talk about Jesus. They just talk about their drinking and cussing. Because they're trying to tell them that you've got to be really good to get to heaven. And they want, they want to show them what salvation is. C, most people won't say C, but a lot of people think it's C. A lot of people, as I preach today, you look at the person on your left and the person on your right and the person behind you, and you're thinking, well, if there is a heaven, I'm going before they do. <laughs> and so, if they making it, I know. If, if they making it, I know I'm making it. Uncle Joe, he said he is a believer, so I know I'm getting there. Most people won't say see, but a lot of people think see. Right? A lot of people do. You know what the answer is? The answer is perfect. Stay with me. It's perfect. Listen to me. The answer is D. If you want to go to heaven, you have to be perfect. And I don't mean sort of perfect. I don't mean like 80% perfect. That's not even... How can you be 80%? It's like saying I'm 80% pregnant. You're either, you're either pregnant... Or you're not pregnant. You can't be 80% perfect. So you got to be 100% perfect. Right? So God demands, read His Word, God demands perfection. It's a shocking thought because we live in a world that is imperfect. And there's nothing perfect about our world. The even thought of perfection is hard to grasp. If you ask people, do you have to be perfect to go to heaven? Most people will say no. Right? That's just what we're going to say. We'll say God will allow people that are just pretty good into heaven. And so what brings us, it brings us really to this point that we've got one of two options to go to heaven. We can be 100% perfect from start to finish. Or we can find someone who would be perfect in our place. Did you hear me? We have to be perfect to get there, guys. The problem is, none of you or me are. So we must find the perfect person to take our place. And he did. If the option is one or two, be perfect or find some, we blew number one years ago. Whenever the age of accountability was, 30 seconds after that, you blew it. <laughs> and so you can't say, well, I'll start today. My past was imperfect, but I'll start today. What does that matter to God? Because to enter into God's perfect heaven, you must have been perfect from the beginning to the end of your days. And we've all blown it already. But we can rest in Christ. We can trust in Him. 
I want you to watch this movie clip. It's from a movie called Fireproof. Caleb, if I were to ask you why you're so frustrated with Catherine, what would you say? She's stubborn. She makes everything difficult for me. She's ungrateful. She's constantly griping about something. Has she thanked you for anything you've done the last 20 days? No! And you'd think after I wash the car, I change the oil, do the dishes, clean the house, that she would try to show me a little bit of gratitude. But she doesn't. In fact, when I come home, she makes me feel like I'm, like I'm an enemy. I'm not even welcome in my own home, Dad. That is what really ticks me off. Dad, for the last three weeks, I have bent over backwards for her. I have tried to demonstrate that I still care about this relationship. I bought her flowers, which she threw away. I have taken her insults and her sarcasm, but last night was it. I made dinner for her. I did everything I could to demonstrate that I care about her, to show value for her, and she spat in my face. She does not deserve this, Dad. I am not doing it anymore. How am I supposed to show love to somebody over and over and over who constantly rejects me? That's a good question. Dad, that is not what I'm doing. Isn't it? No. Dad, that is not what this is about. Son, you just asked me. How can someone show love over and over again when they're constantly rejected? Caleb, the answer is, you can't love her because you can't give her what you don't have. I couldn't truly love your mother until I understood what love really was. It's not because I get some reward out of it. I've now made a decision to love your mother whether she deserves it or not. Son, God loves you even though you don't deserve it. Even though you've rejected him. Spat in his face. God sent Jesus to die on the cross and take the punishment for your sin because he loves you. The cross was offensive to me until I came to it. But what I did, Jesus Christ changed my life. That's when I truly began to love your mom. Son, I can't settle this for you. This is between you and the Lord. But I love you too much not to tell you the truth. Can't you see that you need him? Can't you see that you need His forgiveness? Yes. Will you trust Him with your life? Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 the word of God says but God showed his great love great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners God did it when we deserved it the least you ever looked at someone and thought They don't deserve to be saved. Have you ever looked at one? Maybe they've hurt you and hurt you and hurt you. They failed you over and over and over again. And you can't even conceive that God's salvation could change their life. They don't deserve God's salvation. 
You're right, they don't. And neither do you. God did what he did when we least deserved it. God didn't die for me while I was preaching, leading people to Christ. He didn't die for me when I was praising Him and worshiping Him. He didn't die for me when I was saying no to sin and yes to God. He died for me in my most wicked state. He died for me when I was saying no to Him and yes to myself. God didn't die for you when you was in the church pew praising the Lord. God died for you when you was shooting up and cussing Him and, and running from your family and, and being the ungodly person that you ever were or are right now in your most wicked state. That is the place that God died for you in. You ever watch these movies that portray the crucifixion? And when I watch them, I, I don't know, I, I get angry. I get caught up in it. I get angry at the crowd. Jesus is walking up the road and the people yelling at him. I get angry at those people. They're shouting insults and mocking him, spitting at him. It makes me angry when the Roman soldiers are whipping him and beating him and pulling out his beard. It makes me mad. When they're shouting at him on the cross saying, Come off the cross if you really are the Son of God. It, righteous indignation rises up within me. The, the, the soldiers are gambling on his garments and the disciples just forsook him. And I get all angry and upset. But then I remember that, that crowd is me. Those people doing that, that's me. you watch it and you're like why doesn't God just zap them all send them all to hell treating Jesus like that and then you remember that Jesus is there because they're that way the fact that they're yelling and railing and doing all that's why he's there it's why it's the biggest lie the devil ever sell you when you give your heart to Christ and you fail and he, and he tries to push you away from God's people, push you away from God's presence and he brings your sins up in your face and says, you don't deserve to be there, you don't need to be there. That's the biggest lie the devil ever sells. And if you can ever, ever realize that it's just a lie from him, it changed your life. Because the reason that you failed the reason you are who you are, the reason you still struggle with things, the reason you still get up battling yourself, that is why Jesus went to the cross. That is why He did what He did. It's because He loves you. Not just when you're at your best, but while you were still in sin and didn't care, didn't give a rip about God. It was then that He died for you. God did what he did when we were the worst we would ever be and Jesus the Bible says like a sheep didn't open his mouth didn't utter a word except for a few things he said father forgive him in other words he was saying dad I, I know I know, Dad, this makes you angry. I know that you have to turn your back. But remember, this is why I'm here. Forgive them. So I don't, I don't know whether to shout or cry. I'm in the same place I was earlier. As God spilled His blood on the cross, He saw, for some of you, your current state of rebellion. And He died for you. He loves you. That question, does God love me? It has been settled forever. It's over. It's done. He does. And He wants you to have salvation. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. <laughs> For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made 
unto salvation. In verse 13, he says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The church makes it complicated. Religious people get it all muddied up. The self-righteous make you think it's not possible for you. God says His plan of salvation is simple. God did the hard part. God did the difficult thing. God did it. Well, serving God is tough. It's hard. And I'm with you. Sometimes it's a sacrifice. Sometimes you have to lay your own selfish stuff to the side. And you serve God because you know that's what, that's, that's what you should do. It's what you need to do. So you just do it. And sometimes it's difficult. Especially when I'm walking in my flesh. Sometimes it's hard to do the right thing. But I'm reminded, God did the hard part. The stuff that He asked of me, the stuff He asked of me and you, compared to what He did for us, come on. God did the hard part. Jesus is Lord. That's what the scripture says. Speak it with your mouth. Believe it in your heart. And then it says, believe it in your heart. Speak it in your mouth. Why does he mix it up? He's just telling you, if it's in your heart, it'll come out of your mouth. If it's coming out of your mouth, it's because it's in your heart. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. You're making this too simple, Pastor. I just got to believe Jesus is... I'm telling you what the Bible says. This is not Church Doctrine 101. This is not the Bylaws of Life Worship Center. This is what the Bible says. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 5 and 1. Pastor Lee, if you want to come and play, play a song for us. Look at Romans 5 and 1. Therefore... Since we have been made right in God's sight by faith. That is a mouthful. That right there. We just start all over and just preach that. We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Listen to me. Salvation is is being made right in God's sight. I don't know if this ever happened to you or not, but it's happened to me several times before where I had a day where I just blew it, you know? Maybe there's something I was supposed to do and Jonathan just chose not to. Or just something, I just... I blew it. I fell. I fell short, and I and I and I walked through my day with my head held low, and I allowed that liar, the serpent, to heap condemnation on top of me, and it affected me. It affected my, with my family and how I reacted. It's just, it just, it just not a good day. Sometimes I'll get in front of the mirror and just look at me. Not because I'm good to look at in the mirror, but it's a reality for me sometimes. It reminds me of who I really am without God. And I was looking in the mirror and, and I'm just saying to myself, you're just not, you're not right. You got to get it together. You just, it ain't, you know, right. And I promise I heard the Spirit of the Lord speaking in my heart. And he's done this on more than one occasion. And the words that he spoke to me was, in my eyes, you are. And it reminds me, I don't walk by sight. I walk by faith. Because I walk by faith, I'm made right in 
his side. I didn't say your side. Not even my side sometimes. But in his sight, he's made me right. <laughs> that don't put a smile on your face or a tear to your eye. <laughs> you just something wrong with you. <laughs> Wouldn't you all want that? To be right in his sight? Future obedience will never overcome past disobedience. You're never going to be made right just by changing the way you live. You're made right by trusting in the one who was 100% perfect in word and thought and deed from start to finish. And when you trust in him, he makes you right in his sight. And when you really get in here that he's made you right in his sight, then it opens you up and it gives you freedom to walk the way he wants you to walk. And when you fail and you stumble and you fall, you just get right back up because you remember that he's judging you. You remember that he's looking at you. You remember that when he looks down at you he sees his son and the sacrifice that his son made for you and when he looks down at you he sees saved he sees a soul that is secure he sees a person that is the righteousness of God and when you really believe that in your heart it changes the way that you live You know how to save a drowning man? I read this story of three guys. One of them a really good swimmer. The other two were not that good at swimming. And two of them were on the bank. The guy that was good at swimming was on the bank with the other guy. Another guy was out swimming and he got a cramp. And he was a big guy. And he started yelling for help. And the guy that could swim just stood there and looked at him. And he'd go under and he'd come back up and he'd yell for help and he'd go under and come back up. And the other guy's just looking at him. He's, you going to help him? And he watched the guy. And finally, for the last time, the guy was like, help. And he just gave and he went under. And in like five seconds, the guy jumped off the bank, went into the water, was at him and drug him, pulled him back into the shore. And his friend was like, dude, you are crazy. You about let him die. I thought you knew what you were doing. <laughs> and he said, I know what I'm doing. If I'd have went out there when he was struggling, he'd have took me under with him. We'd both drown. But when he got ready to give up, I knew that's when he could be saved. Y'all hearing me today? I see lots of people come to the altar. And sometimes you can tell, sometimes you can't. But sometimes you can tell somebody's still struggling with the decision. They still think there's something they can do. They still think there's some way they can work it out. But they'll give God a try. But then you see some, and you know it when you see them. That they are tired of the fight. They're tired of the struggle. They're tired. They just, they just, God, whatever, I give up. I'm just saved saved how do you save a drowning man when he quits fighting and he gives up so if you ever call me and say I'm ready to give up if you ever call me and say I've had it I'm ready to give up I, I'm not I don't want to live I'm checking out I'll tell you ahead of time what I'm going to say to you I'm going to say you're in a perfect place for God to save you you're in the perfect place for God to save you. And perhaps somebody here is in that place. Let's all stand. I'm going to be quiet and let God do His thing. You're here today. You're tired of the struggle. You're tired of the fight. Maybe you've come before. But you're still, you still fighting. You're still trying to work this thing out in your own strength and effort and power. But you're tired. You just, you're ready. Give in. Give up. Let go. Let God. Is it you? Is it you? If it's you, come on. Come on. Just step out from where you are right now and come on. If it's one, heaven will rejoice. But I believe there's more. I believe there's more. Are you that person that's ready? Are you that person 
that's done? Are you that person that sees no other solution but God? I want to tell you, God is the solution. And God is ready to bring you salvation. You can stand upon His salvation. You can walk upon His salvation. It is a steady, firm, rock-solid foundation. And today, your soul can be secure in Him. I want to ask some of my prayer warriors, some of our ushers to come. Pray with these that have come to receive Christ into their heart. It's still not too late for you. It's still not... Come on, Christians, saints, believers, right now, I want you to pray. God, move every unbeliever right now. Stir their heart. Convict their soul. That every person that isn't sure, come right now. Come forward. Come to this place of surrender. Come to this place of surrender. Give up. Let go. Turn it over to God. And trust in Him. If your way of living has failed you, come on, surrender. Surrender to God's plan. Surrender to God's purpose. Surrender to God's plan for your life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on and worship Him. We worship You. We worship You, Jesus. We honor You in this place, Lord. Thank You, Jesus. Thank You, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I pray for my brothers and my sisters right now. Come on, just surrender your heart to God. Say, I trust in you, Jesus. I trust in you, Jesus. I place my life in your care. I give everything I've got to you. I surrender my whole heart, my life, my life, my heart. I surrender to you today, Christ. I trust in you that you died for me. While I was a sinner, you died for me, and you rose again. I believe in you, Lord. I believe in you, Lord. I believe in you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray for every person that is here right now. And they're not sure, but they haven't come forward. I just pray that right now your grace will rest upon them. That right there where they are, Lord, they would turn it over to you right there where they are God they would turn it all over to you Lord I thank you Father I praise you Jesus I praise you Jesus